This is Anna Adamek in Vancouver, August 29, 2017. Could you please give me your name and tell me where you were born? My name is William Davenport. People call me Bill. I was born in Braylon, British Columbia, which is about 200 kilometers north of Vancouver, where we're recording. Could you talk a bit about your childhood? What were your interests when you were a child? Um, well, I grew up in West Vancouver, which is a very secluded community. You had to cross two bridges to get to it, so it was very safe. And uh, we were allowed to explore everywhere, and so I did, mainly on bicycle. Uh, so exploring was one, cycling was another. Um, I would say swimming, did quite a bit of swimming because it's right on the, the ocean. And then music. I was uh, in a boys band for many, many years and enjoyed that very much. And we traveled a lot uh, within British Columbia, within Canada, and even to Europe. So my conductor wanted me to be a musician, but it turned out to be an engineer. <laughs> Were your parents involved in science, or did they encourage you um, to pursue science? Well, my dad was uh, was working in a uh, mine, a copper gold mine. It's a uh, Britannia mine, which is just up the coast here. And uh, then he was working at the little town I was born, which is a Braylorn mine. So it was always kind of technical. And I always understood that I was going to go to UBC and, and be in, study to be an engineer. That was, that was my future. <laughs> so it turned out, yeah. Could you talk about your education? Uh, you mean the details or the Oh yes, quality, details or? about your, no, details. Where did you go to school? Well, I went to school uh, in West Vancouver. And there were two uh, elementary schools at that time. One was uh, Hollyburn which is dearest to us, and the other one was uh, Pauline Johnson, which was named after a rather famous uh, British Columbia painter. So those were two little schools, and I recently visited them, and then to uh, West Vancouver High School, which uh, was kind of old. And when we started grade seven, we moved into temporary buildings because it was just after the war people were moving in. And uh, then they built a new high school for us up to the top of the hill, which was West Vancouver High, which was very high quality, I must say, very high quality. And uh, we'll talk about mentors later, and I'll tell you some of those teachers. And then, um, then as I say, I was going to UBC, and we drove over every day over the Lionsgate Bridge and up to UBC. Uh, carpooling, and the uh, my brother John joined me there the second the, the following year. So we all traveled together. Was very uh, companionable and uh, very good, really. I thought, and uh, I knew I wanted to be in engineering, and uh, I could have been chemical engineering, which my son is, or metallurgical engineering, which I am. So it was a very, very good education for me. And you chose to do your PhD at the Royal School of Mines in London, England. Why there? Yes, yes. Well, of course, I graduated from UBC. I had my master's degree. And I was working in uh, New York. And uh, I decided I wanted to do a PhD. And uh, for us at that time, we thought there were two choices. One was MIT, which was in Boston, and uh, Imperial College in London, which is the Royal School of Mines. And I, I wanted to travel. I think that was maybe the main reason we went there. But there were also, uh, 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 there was kind of a route for Commonwealth students to come there. It was. It's part of the Commonwealth Institute in London. And also there were two of my uh, student colleagues from UBC were there. And uh, they, it was, uh, there was no fee. And I got 500, uh, 500 pounds a year. And my wife went with me. I was married before I went to New York. 
And uh, so she came and she uh, got about 400 pounds a year for working. So we had 900 pounds a year, which was just enough to get by. So uh, no, it was uh, very easy for us to get along. And there were a lot of Commonwealth students, a lot of English students. We had a fine time there. Mm -hmm. So how about your academic advisors? Is there someone who's really memorable? Um, well, could I go back one step to West Vancouver? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I don't know whether I would call him an advisor, but uh, as a teacher, I had, we had a rather lucky break. I was also studying, I was studying Latin, and there were uh, six of us who wanted to do the advanced mathematics, but there was no class for us. So they put on a special class for six of us, and the teacher really taught us very well. And we taught ourselves, of course, with only six, you could really teach yourself. So he, that was a really good thing. And uh, before he died, I wrote to him and said how much uh, he was important to my career because I still use algebra every day. What was his name? Uh, Mr. Kershaw. And he had an interesting, uh, he was interesting because it would have been 1945, maybe. So the war had just ended. He was in Europe, and I think he was installing radar. He was an electrical engineer. And I think he was installing radar into airplanes. So they immediately moved him towards uh, the Pacific. But the war ended before he got there, <laughs> just as he arrived in Vancouver. And he got a job at teaching in West Vancouver. Who else do you consider your mentors? Um, I'd see my... I'll start with perhaps my professors. I think uh, Professor Williams at McGill University. I'm, I'm jumping. <laughs> he wasn't. He was a colleague at McGill University. He was probably my my main mentor from 1964 to 1981. All the time I was in McGill. Now, as the teachers, uh, Professor Bradshaw at Imperial College. I think he taught me, first of all, he taught me how to write. And what he did was, I would write something during the day, but he would take it home, and he would always have it read the next day. And that really, really set me up for life. And I did, always did that as a professor. Mm -hmm. But my students, whom I also taught that to, never did that. <laughs> it took some, took some gumption to get that kind of thing done. So Professor Bradshaw. I think those are the two that would really count. Uh, Professor uh, Deguri from Toronto. Uh, he and I traveled together to Japan many times, and he was he was also a mentor. Do you remember your first day at work? Not so much actually. Now that you ask that, not so much. I, there was a there was a UBC graduate there, and he introduced me to to the people. But I don't really, that part I don't remember. I was pretty young, I think. So after you graduated with your PhD in England, you moved back to Canada immediately? Mm -hmm. or did, mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, why did you move back? Well, to be honest, well, they wanted me to stay there uh, in, uh, in England. But we, we really yearned to get home. <laughs> I think that's probably the real reason we walked. And then uh, I did have a job offer from McGill, mm -hmm. which I got by serendipity while I was at uh, Imperial College. And we had a new baby, and my wife was pregnant. <laughs> so we needed a job. Closer to home, too. <laughs> but I can remember my first day at McGill. Yes. So we arrived by ship. We sailed over the Strait of Belle Isle and come down and through the St. Lawrence and landed at Montreal. And uh, we were, it's my wife and I and the baby, uh, we're just taking our time to go through customs and immigration. When uh, Professor Williams came on and he dragged us off, <laughs> he said, Professor Davenport has to get back up to the university. He said, <laughs> so, uh, 
and he just took me up there and uh, met all the faculty. And then we stayed with his family for uh, maybe a week, and then found a little apartment near the university. So that was that was the first day. What was the culture like, uh, research culture like at McGill at the time? Uh, the re research culture. Well, it wasn't as advanced as it was at Imperial College, but uh, it, it was it was really it was really developing, and and in that uh, time period, which was the late '60s, it really grew, and some more of us came from Imperial College, at, probably at my recommendation, I suppose. The two others came. Could you give me the names? Uh, Rob Guthrie, still there, and Phil Biston, who I just learned today had passed away a couple of years ago. So, um, and then went just a general growth, and research became very much more important. So, what research did you conduct at McGill in those first years, uh, 1960s? Yeah, sorry, I didn't quite hear that. Uh, what research did you conduct at oh, McGill oh, in 1960s? Okay. Yes. So when I got there, I really carried on my the research I've been doing in London, which was uh, really process research, particularly with regard to gas injection into metals and things like that. Um, and then, uh, then I moved into my own research, which was in copper. And uh, under Professor Williams' uh, suggestion, I, you know, at Imperial College, we were kind of kind of academic, for instance. <laughs> but I could see our students didn't, didn't really need that at McGill. They really needed some industrial aspects. So he suggested that I go out every summer, which was uh, two or three months, to work in a industrial plant. So I did that, first of all, with Canadian copper refiners in Montreal, East Montreal, then to uh, Gas Bay Copper, which was out in Gas Bay, and it was a smelter, copper smelter. Then um, Canadian Electro Living Zinc, which is just west of Montreal. And finally, to um, with mining, mining and smelting in Belledoon. Shell operations in Quebec done in French or in English? Well, it was all English in those days. But not in Valleyfield, not so much in Valleyfield. But uh, so, the Canadian copper refiners, I think it was just changing. And there were a huge number of workers that wasn't very automated. And they were, I guess the heavy workers were largely immigrants, as I remember. But it was, it seemed to me it was mainly English. So there was no problem communicating? No, no, there wasn't. And, uh, same was true in Valleyfield. I think there was a little more French in Valleyfield. And I've been out to there recently, and now it's all French. <laughs> so uh, uh, I think I could have communicated. <laughs> How long were you at McGill? 17 years. So I uh, started my research. And, uh, the research I'm best known for is probably uh, in copper refining, copper electro winning, copper smelting. But I did some other research on uh, aluminum, aluminum production I was trying to work on and uh, vacuum purification. I worked on those. And uh, let's see. I think that's, that's about all. And, but I started writing my books then, too. That was the other thing. I started, uh, I did a sabbatical half year in Queensland, Australia. And I met there uh, Professor Biswas. I should call him another mentor now that I think that Professor Biswas is in the University of Queensland. And uh, so I had the opportunity there to visit all the metallurgical operations in Australia, pretty well all of them. So, uh, and I visited several copper ones, so I spoke to Camille and said, uh, 
perhaps we should write a book on this subject. And so we did, starting in 1971 and finishing in 1976. So those, uh, that was how I got. So I would say he was the mentor as far as getting books published. And uh, I noticed that your books deal with um, theoretical approaches, but also practice. Yes. So did you work with industries at this time too? Um, could you talk a bit more about that approach, linking to theory and practice? Yes, yes. Well, uh, I would say one of the things I did virtually all my life was uh, visit industrial plants. And uh, maybe averaging about 12 a year. I just enjoyed doing that. So when you say work with uh, industrial plants, certainly I had some students that were working in there and their colleagues, but I also visit, if I, was, if I had a, an industrial question, I would go and visit the plant. And that involved you know, all, over, all over Canada, in Quebec and Ontario, Manitoba, British Columbia, and then also in the United States, uh, Georgia, Coffee making places. So uh, I, I certainly had ex access to everything I needed to know in, in industry. When did you decide to move to University of Arizona and why? Um, I moved in 81. Uh, by that time I was working on last, uh, flash furnace copper, copper smelting. And uh, although there was one in Canada, it was at uh, Sudbury and in Inco, Sudbury, they were building six in Arizona, in, not in Arizona, but Arizona, New Mexico, uh, and uh, Utah. So I went down there to be the, at the center of that industry. And then, uh, like, with, like with going to McGill, uh, I got a letter from Arizona saying, please come down and be the head of my department, be the head of our department. So, so I did that. Did you find any differences or similarities between the two universities? Well, uh, uh, McGill is an international university, uh, which gave it a certain flavor. Uh, Arizona, though, at that time was uh, an institution that was supposed to educate the children of taxpayers. It had a very narrow uh, objective. But while I was there, uh, I would say it, it uh, changed into a research one university in the States, uh, with a, lot of, a huge space program, uh, quite a large material science program, uh, and uh, a, a big hospital of its own, so it really did change into a research uh, institution. I guess under the pressure of funding more than anything, but, but it became really quite active and uh, surprisingly so. I think I think it wasn't the research one to start with because you needed air conditioning. A lot of those buildings didn't have air conditioning. That's an interesting yeah. point. <laughs> Uh, you are an expert on extractive metallurgy, yes. so could you tell me what that involves? Well, as I interpret it, it, uh, it starts on the uh, left, you might say, with geology and what we might call oral genesis, how ores are formed. Uh, then maybe then geology, then geological engineering, then mining engineer, mine development. Uh, mineral processing or beneficiation, uh, smelting, uh, and along with smelting, uh, sulfur dioxide control, and then uh, radiation and smelting and environmental control is what I look at, and then refining and uh, I'd say. Purificate or quality control. Quality control is the problem. That's the way I look at it. And I'm, I was always thought of as the expert on smelting uh, and, and, and refining. But I, I moved quite a bit.
towards geology and orogenesis. I just began to think that was very the key. Those were keys to uh, to uh, obtaining metals from ores. So that's that's more or less how I think about it. What other areas did you research? Uh, what are your areas of research at the University of Arizona? Well, I stayed with uh, I stayed with uh, copper smelting and copper refining, but a new field d developed actually in Arizona, and it's uh, solvent extraction purification, which involves uh, leaching oxide ores, or then oxide ores and calcite. You get an impure liquid, and with a sol uh, uh, an organic solvent, you extract pure copper from that solution, and then electrolyte from there. So there was a lot of work going on with different solvents, how best to do it. So, frankly, I got into the in, in, in on the on the bottom floor when that started because we had the very first one in Arizona, very very first one, maybe the first two. It's a tie between the second ones. One one was in Zambia and one is in was in Arizona. So I just took on that field then, and I, I wouldn't say became an expert, but an expert expert in the application. So that I moved in that direction. You have a number of patents. Um, what are your inventions? Well, I have a couple of patents. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say they've been adopted <laughs> very, very much. One was we were trying to, you know, aluminum, had, it's, a, it's a difficult process or a very energy intensive process. So we were looking to find a room temperature process. And one of my students, Guido Capuano, uh, had an idea how, how to do that, and it was using solvents of various kinds. And so we were trying to use that to get uh, low energy production of aluminum and we got good plating and we were making making uh, good aluminum but the solvents weren't very stable so that, that wouldn't end to that one really. The other one was with uh, several people with Henry uh, Solomon de Friedberg who I'm going to be meeting this afternoon and Ralph Harris, Professor Harris on vacuum purification of steel. Uh, the vapor pressure of the impurities, particularly copper, under vacuum uh, is just enough to give a little bit of purification. And copper and steel is a deadly impurity. It weakens it. You just can't use it. And uh, it worked pretty well. I went and visited several plants. I went to visit a plant in Buffalo, New York, to see how how it would work. And although it would work, industrially it would have been a little hard to, to adopt. So, and then at that time I was leaving, leaving the field. And he went on with that research, Ralph, Ralph did. Is there a set of innovations or an innovation that you are especially proud of? You know, I think, I think it's, I think it's mainly my books. Uh, you know, some are just descriptive, like copper, extractive metal here, copper. Um, the iron glass furnace I wrote in 1979, and the person I was having lunch with had read it and has a copy. <laughs> uh, where it took a, if it took a uh, theoretical look at, at that process, glass furnace melting, developed in France. So, as the very last lecture I got in steel making at UBC, had what they called the Ries diagram. And it was clear that none of us understood it. I don't think the professor understood it either. So, that was 1959. So, in um, 1970, maybe, 19, maybe 1976. After I finished the copper book, I said, why don't I have a look at that? And so I went to it from the basics and developed the whole theory. I could explain what these, this, the graphical pro approach uh, actually meant. And I could get an equation for each of the lines. And it told me if you added oxygen, what it would do. If you 
increase the temperature of the glass, what it would do, and the lines would all shift, and I could predict why. But the interesting thing with that book, you know, it was quite uh, quite uh, interesting because it had to have points on the graphs, and some of them I couldn't figure out. But many nights I would wake up, and I would have a I would have an equation for that point, and it would always be wrong. And I would write it down. Then finally, I did wake up, and it was right. So it's kind of a serendipity way that that worked. So I went on from there. And I think that was it was still it's still in print. Mm -hmm. So it's part of that. And then I did uh, the same with flash smelting. I think uh, it opened some eyes on uh, kind of the whole way this kind of smelting room went with flash smelting, which is uh, which is oxidation of sulfur, fine sulfide particles from uh, from uh, from flotation. And so we could predict, you know, what the what the the grade of the uh, product should be as compared to how much oxygen you put in or how much heat you put in, things like that. So some people consider that my best book. It might be. <laughs> what was the most difficult project that you worked on? Um, one that didn't go off too well, do you mean? One that was maybe the most dysfunctional that you would consider a failure. Oh, well, I was writing a book on uranium and uh, I had two or three co-authors, but I was the only one that did any, any writing. And I understand that because as a professor, you know, you, you can do what you want or whatever's best. And they were working and they just couldn't get it together. In fact, I sat beside one of the potential co-authors <laughs> for lunch. And he's quite, he's quite sad about it. But I said, oh, no, no, you just got to move on. And I just moved on right away. So it was a little difficult. So how th that actually leads me to the next question. How do you see the difference between the research culture in academia and within the industry? Well, the beauty of, uh, the beauty of research at a university is uh, how free you are. You know, your limitations are quite a bit less. You also have very young students, malleable students maybe. Uh, so I like those aspects, and I kind of like the aspects of the university. You could work, uh, I felt like you could work as much as you wanted, and I've always liked that. When I first went to work and people were only working eight hours a day, it just felt, it didn't feel right for me, so that's probably why I became an academic. Uh, it's become a little more difficult because funding is harder to get. But uh, but I work very closely. For example, in uh, in Montreal, there was the uh, Randa Research Center. I worked very closely with those people, and a number of my students were in there, and uh, they all did they all did well under that uh, kind of work. And now I'm working with uh, people from uh, Hatch in Burlington. And likewise, mm -hmm. it's nice to be working with people who are related to the industry. And some of those, several, two of those people are in blast furnaces almost <laughs> every day, kind of thing. Who are your, your most memorable students? Um, well, Guido, Guido Capuana, who I, I referred to, he, he was a mature student. And he had, uh, I think he had escaped from Italy right after the war or something like that, and came, came to Canada. And uh, he was a big, gruff guy. <laughs> and uh, he had many ideas, many ideas, many good, many good uh, chemical ideas. That, and in fact, he, he was the, at least that year, he had the, uh, what I would call the best dissertation of uh, anyone when he had graduated. But unfortunately, he was also interested in money, and, and, and so he was always worried about trying to sell this. And I, I just couldn't quite agree with him on that. So, 
but he was an exceptional student. Um, now, a second one was Matt King, who was now in Perth, Australia, and I, we worked together on, uh, on sulfuric acid. So I need, I need to discuss with you a little bit, you know, if you have a sulfide ore, you're going to produce some sulfur in some form, and most of it is going into sulfuric acid, which is a marketable product. But uh, nobody really knew how the process worked. And so Matt and I developed, uh, uh, let's say, a matrix, matrix algebra approach to it, and equilibrium approach to it, and worked all that out. And eventually we could tell, tell the industry how they should uh, arrange their processes. And I'm really quite proud of that. that worked. So, and and uh, Matt was a wonderful student too. He was the, he was another best. He had the best what we call preliminary exam of the year he was doing that. So he was uh, very good also. Were there many women involved in the fields that uh, no, that you were? Not too many. Too many. I I, uh, I worked closely with two while I was in Arizona. Uh, See if I can remember Sandy Sandy Fowler, who was a very good student. We worked on the uh, solvent extraction, as I described. But she ended up after her master's degree. Uh, she's a material specialist for helicopters, <laughs> so she moved away on something else. And the other one was Chris Combo. She did become an environmental engineer with. Uh, with several copper and uh, several corporation copper operations, I really enjoyed working with those two. I read that another uh, area of your expertise is the application of thermodynamics and process engineering principles to extractive metallurgy processes. Yeah. Could you explain this? Well, I think so. Again, I'll, I'll revert back to the uh, sulfuric acid. Uh, we actually did develop a. a thermodynamic equilibrium equation for that process, which is really one of the steps in making the sulfuric acid is oxidize SO2 to SO3, and essentially you dissolve the SO3 in water and make sulfuric acid. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's the general principle. So we, we developed this thermodynamic equation really Based on algebra, I can really go back to to Mr. Kershaw and say, you know, that, that, that's how I could figure that out. And then we decide, we could tell what uh, should be done with uh, the amount of uh, air that one used in the process of oxygen, and especially as as you oxidize the SO2 to SO3, there's uh, it heats up and you have catalysts. And you don't want to um, overheat the catalyst, so we determined how how, do you, how you could avoid that, and yet get uh, high efficiency of SO2 oxidation. So it's hard to describe. But you have, I'll, I'll just uh, just try and describe. But we have an equation which we developed, and we have matrix algebra, and we work the two together. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of unique. What is your fondest memory that relates to your work? Um, let's see. Let's see. You know, I, I might have just described it to you. <laughs> you know, I might, I might really have done that. Was the most unique thing, and and in this equilibrium equation, we we. Uh, it just, just came out of algebra that I've been taught, and I, I really can't say too much more than that. That was the thing I really enjoyed. Uh, let's see. I don't think that would be a problem. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts um, on innovation culture in Canada today, in the past and today? 
Well, that, not, not having lived here for a while, I'm not sure, but I've been talking to people here, and they they do seem to be doing a lot of uh, things that the, the one I sat beside today, he's, uh, he's now, now stationed in Germany, and he's applying things that he learned here in Canada. And we sat with another one that has a company here, and uh, I was surprised. They really, they developed it here, they developed. One of the problems is uh, what they said to me, British Columbia is the most costly manufacturing region of the world. <laughs> but it might be pretty close too. By able to, he was able to locate uh, suppliers around the world and started the business here and uh, now the markets throughout the world as well. So it seems to be in pretty good shape from what I just what I've learned here. And how did the academic culture change throughout your career? Well, I'd say one thing, you don't write on the board anymore. <laughs> That's a total change. And I'm not sure it's a good one, but it's a total change. Um, there's a, there are a lot, a lot more techniques for it, of course, distance learning, uh, and uh, ev now the students get the, all the notes before the course, so electronically, so those things have all changed. And uh, I'm not sh sure that I was completely pre prepared for that. <laughs> And it would have taken quite a lot of effort to to do that. But I was nearing retirement, so I I kind of gave that up. Uh, but of course, I was already the old. And did the relationship between academia and industries change within your career? No, I don't. I kept up visiting plants until maybe two or three years ago. So. Uh, you know, I would go to a conference in Germany, I would then visit three or four German plants. I had opportunities to go to uh, South Africa, visit all their, their uh, platinum. I, I would say that maybe that's an, another thing I'm quite proud of is, I, one of the books I wrote was uh, Extract and Metallurgy of um, Nickel Cobalt and Platinum Blue Metals. Now, Nobody had put them together, even though in the periodic table they're arranged together. So I managed to do that, and uh, so I'm, I'm quite proud of that. I don't, I haven't received any comments from that book, so I don't, I don't know how good that is. But I, th I think that was a pretty good one. So I was still trying to do the same things, and still today trying to do the same things I did maybe in 1967 or something like that. Mm -hmm. So not too much. I'm thinking about closure of uh, certain research centers like Noranda, uh, yeah. Alcan, uh, in Kingston. Mm. Did this mm. have an impact mm. on academics? Mm -hmm. I think I think there are not as many as there used to be, as far as I can see. Uh, I was talking to somebody today about uranium, and I think their research center has recently closed down. So perhaps not as much as it once was. I'm I'm only kind of guessing on that. Mm -hmm. And what are your views on uh, innovations that come out of uh, metallurgical industries today? Well, the, uh, there was a talk at lunch today, and I sh it's an innovation that I could see happening. It was happening when I was at UBC, it was Professor uh, Frank Forward who was working on, uh, on uh, pressure leaching, oxygen pressure leaching. And the plant is in Fort Saskatchewan, Alberta. It's what's called, I think it's still called Sherrod Gordon. And they really started this whole field of, uh, of leaching of sulfide ores, and even leaching of oxide ores. So that, that's been a major contribution by Canadian uh, research both at uh, in, uh, Ottawa, at the UBC, and at Fort Saskatchewan. That's a, a very big success. And they're still working on it mm -hmm. with a new plant in Madagascar. 
Um, the, the changes in, in maybe social perceptions, um, such as, for example, uh, environmental movement, had any impact on your work? I was... Uh, well, I, I was... I became in, very interested in the environment with, when I started to write Fly Smelting, because that was one of the things it, it could do. It was an effic efficient uh, capture system for capturing SO2. You know, prior to that, when I when I first came here, I first, when I first went to McGill, uh, we visited these smelters, and they were just horrible. All the all the SO2 was just going into the atmosphere. And we had acid rain and all that, all that kind of stuff. And the flash smelting was one way to get out of that because it was a uh, it smelted particulates with oxygen or, or preheated air or oxygen enriched air and that gas could be cap uh, captured and made into sulfuric acid very efficiently and uh, so th that did kind of dominate my work for a while and still and then I sulfuric acid book exactly the same thing so those, those were the objectives of those books and uh, so it Again, I get, when I told you I, it's, it's uh, geology and so on and smelting and then environment, that's really what I mean. That was, so I devoted a lot of time to that. And I'm devoting my time now to uh, carbon footprint with the book we're writing on the glass furnace. So I would say I, I devoted my later years in part to that field. And I think with some success. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. So you are an academic, but you know the industry. Um, I believe you have your own practice, uh, consulting yes. practice now. So what would be your advice to, to a young student of metallurgy, just starting the career? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, enjoy your work. Maybe that's, maybe that's the first thing. And if you join, not enjoying it, look for something else. Um, I'd say look, look to the future. What, what are the innovations going to be? What can you contribute? Um, both in the way of purity and environment safety. Uh, I'm working with two young men now, that must be in their 20, 25, and try to, uh, try to think of their work as Is that possible? You know, I have some feeling towards it, and I think, I think they do. So that's, that's what I would say. And one thing in, in working for Hatch, they get, uh, they get uh, young students, call them uh, interns. Is that, that we're using in Canada? So they get four month interns. Since I've been working with them, they've had three of them, and the other one's arriving. So uh, I can encourage him to enjoy, especially enjoy the work, and I'm hoping he will go through my book and solve the problems. <laughs> Are there any events um, that you, through, throughout your career, that you noticed that uh, we must study, uh, we really have to understand, to understand the, the field of metallurgy? I think that's probably more more into the field of alloy development. And uh, the one thing I did with the, the rare earth book was again I visited plants all over the world. But I visited them. Uh, one was uh, Catalyst Factory, and uh, that's where they make the alloys that capture the pollution from automobiles. So. I think looking for that kind of uh, catalysts, anything that will help the environment. And uh, visited a magnet factory, because the rares are using magnets, and very powerful magnets. I don't know whether you've heard of, heard of them. 
Uh, so I learned a lot about that, and I watched uh, one being made and uh, made and oriented. Uh, so working on you know improving those kind of things. Uh, what's the other one? So magnets, catalysts. <laughs> I forgot what the third one is. Batteries, batteries. Oh, there you go, batteries. That's a big one. I see. I can see batteries as a real goal because you know the trouble with wind, electricity, and solar electricity. You can't do it when the wind drops or when the night comes. But you need to be able to store it. So. I think those uh, uh, batteries It's very interesting. Now, I worked on rare earth batteries, which are very good. But lithium batteries, because of their lightness, are, uh, are um, and their storage capacity are, are much better. I think that's really a good direction right now. I think. So it was interesting to get in involved in all of those fields. And the, the magnets are used for you know, you might have 200 magnets in your car, and uh, they're very powerful. And the smaller they are, the better they are. So, mm -hmm. research in that direction. I think every handbag has one. Ah. Oh, I see. Yeah, I see. Oh, I they see. are everywhere. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> what are you proudest of in your life? Not just work, but your Can life. I work. Oh. Well, I think. In spite of all I've talked to you about, my, my family is certainly my, my everything. And uh, I can tell you right now, my son is in Houston, <laughs> where all the flooding is going wow. on. <laughs> so we're a little, little worried about that. Well, he seems to be in, in, uh, on dry ground. So I would say family was really everything. And everything, what's it, if that's in good shape, I'm in good shape. So your wife traveled quite a bit with you. Yes, she did. Did she work, or uh, was she taking? She's a school teacher. Um, she also went to UBC, and she went to normal school in Victoria. I guess does an old word "normal school" mean anything to you? Right? <laughs> Teacher yes. college, I guess. <laughs> uh, she worked. Uh, she taught on Vancouver Island, and. Then she uh, taught in Trail Race Columbia. That's, that's, part, that's part of the thing. Maybe I should just go back to my earlier life. Mm -hmm. The real advantage I had as a young man was uh, I had summer jobs, virtually always. So I worked in fish cannery, worked in sawmill, I worked uh, in, the, in the forests. And I worked two years in Minko, uh, consolidated mining and smelting, as we call it in those days, in trail. So even when uh, when I left school, I had an industrial mm -hmm. background. That was very helpful. I lost a bit of it while I was in Imperial COVID. But anyway, to go on, she was teaching at Trail, and that's where we met. So we got married the year after being in Trail. She was teaching there, and then she taught a year after year after we married. And then she was going to teach in England, but she was advised not to do that. So she, she worked as a she worked as a clerk somewhere, and for eight pounds a week. Is there anything you would like to add? No, I think. Well, I, I, I would say that traveling, traveling the world, that was such a good part of my life. And brought on by this, by my career, really. So I traveled virtually everywhere. The only way, place I didn't go was Russia. Uh, I, I went there as a tourist, but not as a metallurgist, which I was sorry about because there were things that I would like to see. I even traveled to Poland <laughs> to. Uh, to Brussels and, mm -hmm. uh, and Katowice. Huta Katowice. <laughs> oh, yes. And Pitnitsa, uh, Rogov, all those wow. copper, copper places. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so no, every, virtually everywhere except Russia, except Russia. Kazakhstan, Mendo too. So I wonder from your travels, did you see, was there something that was really striking about differences in countries or maybe similarities when it comes to the field to metallurgy? Um, well, I think, uh, if I might say, the, the, so the Soviet system really held, held things back a bit. Because they were told what they had to do, but other than that, everywhere I have to I have to speak highly of Germany. Wonderful, wonderful industry. The workers wear ties. <laughs> uh, Japan, likewise. I spent I've spent quite a long time in Japan. I've enjoyed that of going back next month or a month after. So, uh, but even there, you know, what I observed was, you wouldn't think we had the same sense of humor, but when you see uh, something without any dialogue, I was laughing at the same place everybody else was. <laughs> so I think people, people must be near this. And that's my feeling about it anyway. Well, thank you very much for the interview. Okay. You're welcome.